Dave Kazarowski, a CFA content developer and instructor for the Princeton Review. I have an MBA in investment management and a CFA charter. I'm a professor of finance in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also a former equity research associate and family office portfolio manager. For the Princeton Review, I teach the subjects equity valuation, portfolio management, fixed income, derivatives, and alternative investments. Inflation is one of those parts of our economy that's very difficult to see, but that has a big impact on all of us. Even those who are familiar with it to some degree can tell you that there's a nominal rate of return and a real rate of return and can do the math between them. But very few people actually understand what is underneath all of that, what causes it. Here in this video, I'm going to take you through the causes and aspects of inflation, especially as it relates to debt, which is very strongly connected to inflation. I always tell this personal story uh, in the degree classes that I teach about inflation. In 1994, I was a freshman in college, and there was a soda machine in the lobby of my dormitory. And I remember very clearly that it was 75 cents per can of 12 ounce Coca-Cola. Today, that's about double. Depending where you go, it's probably about $1.50. Same can, same aluminum, same recipe, same everything. Why did it go up so much? It's the same thing. On the flip side of that, when I graduated from business school in 2007, I bought a 40-inch Sharp Aquos LCD TV that I was very proud of. It was cutting-edge technology at the time, and it cost me $2,000. If you go to Best Buy today, a 40-inch flat-screen TV would probably cost you about $200. Why? Why did that drop so much while the can of Coke doubled? Well, of course, the answer is inflation. The value of money erodes over time. A lot of people see that. Uh, I'm sure anyone who has grandparents has heard the stories about how candy bars used to cost a nickel, often prompting the response, okay, boomer. Uh, some more financially literate people, definitely some academics, will tell you the difference between the nominal rate of return and the real rate. Of course, the difference to that being inflation. Central banks have a great deal of interest in inflation. Many of them around the world, including the U.S. Federal Reserve, have a target of 2% of inflation per year that they try to meet when they're shepherding the economy. So some very smart people understand what inflation is and want a certain amount of it. Now that's all well and good, but it doesn't get us any closer to understanding what it is or what causes it, what's really behind it and what makes it tick. For me, the best way that inflation can be defined is by thinking of it as a feedback loop. In an economy, everyone wants more money. Companies want to have revenue growth, so they raise prices as much as they can. This is related to some other economic concepts like elasticity that is taught in the CFA and in degree programs. So if they raise prices, then the people who buy from them have to raise prices. So all down the supply chain, companies have to raise prices just because they are being pushed into it by those above them on the chain. Of course, by the time it gets to the end market, prices go up over time, consumers demand more money. So they go back to their employers and ask for a raise. It's referred to as a cost of living increase, generally, rather than a raise. But at the same time, this is um, more than just reactionary. I mean, people want more money. Companies want more money. And I'm sure you have at some point or other been involved in a conversation where a coworker gripes over not making enough because so-and-so is making more. Well, that's one of the building blocks of inflation. Every time one of those conversations occurs, the dollar gets a little bit weaker. So it all fits together in one big feedback loop. From what I can tell, the only real variable involved in this is how fast the change occurs. I mentioned the TV that I bought in 2007 for 10 times what similar TVs sell for today. That is innovation. We learn in economics in the CFA curriculum that Porter's Five Forces includes rivalry between competitors. 
companies are always trying to steal market share, to steal customers away from their competitors. And so they innovate in their products, making them better, faster, cheaper, lowering prices, and stealing away customers. So as long as there's innovation to be had in an industry, then prices will decline until they reach maturity, at which case inflation takes over. There's also the aspect of debt in relation to inflation. If a borrower takes out a loan and money becomes cheaper over time in terms of its purchasing power, that benefits the borrower because then it won't be as difficult to pay it back as it would have been when the loan was taken out. Before going further into the relationship between debt and inflation, let's take a little bit of a closer look at what debt is and how it functions in our economy. The major discrete unit of debt, at least when you see it from the investor standpoint, is a bond. Now, a bond has five major elements to it. The regular payment, referred to as the coupon, the face value, which is the value given back at maturity, the time to maturity, all three of these are explicitly written on the bond certificate. And then two other elements, the price of the bond and the yield. Now the yield is the implied interest rate, often called the discount rate. That yield is used to discount the payments and determine the present value. As you can see the formula here at the bottom of the slide. Now that yield is among all of these very important elements, the most important. It is the interest rate and within it is contained the inflation rate. Very important aspect to all this is that prices and interest rates move in opposite directions. Short version of that explanation is if I invest in a bond that has a specific interest rate and then interest rates rise, my bond becomes less desirable to hold because other debt is being issued at a higher rate. So the price of my bond drops. If we get hyperinflation, an extreme form of inflation, then the price of debt is dropping so fast that banks are reluctant to even issue debt at all, which can severely hobble the economy. The other side of that, deflation, is also very damaging because if debt becomes more valuable over time, the borrowers get more and more punished for holding debt. And a family that takes out a mortgage and finds that their house is what's referred to as underwater, meaning the debt is greater than the value of the house, can be in severe financial trouble. So both sides are very difficult. So inflation, as I've been saying all through here, is an important part of academics, and it's also an important subject uh, throughout the CFA exam. It is in several different portions of the exam, in time value of money, in fixed income, and in economics. So let's take a look at how the CFA uh, treats inflation. Here's a sample question that was written by the Princeton Review. Uh, these are all real numbers. The CPI is the consumer price index is the main gauge of inflation in the United States. So over a 10 year period from January 2010 to January 2020, the CPI went from, as you can see, 216 to 257. Over or at the beginning of that period, the US 10 year government bond had an implied interest rate of 3.86%. So given all of this information, what was the real rate of return for the bond? In order to do that, you would need to find out the average inflation rate and then subtract it from the yield. The 3.85% is the nominal yield. You would need to find the real yield. And the answer, of course, is B. If you were to take the ending value divided by the beginning value to the 10th root, which is the exponential way of determining uh, the average return, then we would see that the average rate of inflation over 10 years is 1.76%. So subtract that from the nominal yield of the 10-year bond of 3.85% gives you a real return of 2.09%.
So for me, the biggest takeaway in all of this is that inflation is a very important part of our economy, but it often stays hidden because it's embedded in a nominal rate or in some other factor that we don't normally see. I hope you found this video informative and that it helps you unlock a little bit more about how the economy works and what factors influence our money and our lives.